Amazing. We, we are really happy with the program. I hope you guys are enjoying today as well and that you're kind of seeing the track that we're trying to put together for everybody and understanding how to show up for yourself, how to access care, how to understand the science, how to engage in your own health care, how to advocate for yourself, potentially how to make an inspire change along the way and paint a really lovely picture of what the future of obesity care and what obesity care in Canada, quite frankly, can look like. And that actually the perfect segue for us moving into our final session of the day today, which is building a better tomorrow and the future of obesity care. So coming back and joining me on stage will be uh, Ian Patton, as well as Dr. David Macklin. And we're super excited to have Dr. Macklin here to help us with our final session today. Um, he may be a familiar face, hello, sir, um, to some of you. Out in the audience, he's definitely a, a friend of the family here at Obesity Canada. We're obviously all super fans as well. Um, but Dr. Macklin is a lecturer at the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine and the University of Toronto trained family physician. He's committed his com career to the prevention and treatment of obesity. And since 2004 has directed multidisciplinary evidence-based behavioral weight management programs. He's a medical doctor in the weight management program at MedCan Clinic and the Medical Weight Management Center of Canada. He's an amazing human. He's a co-author of the Obesity Guidelines. He does a million things for his patients. He's a fantastic doctor. I'm still talking about you, sir. I'm talking about you. Come back, come back to me. Um, and he is really fantastic at helping people connect the dots. So thank you for being here, Dr. Macklin. I would love you to introduce yourself in your own language since apparently you didn't agree with my words at all, 100%. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about you and maybe tell us a little bit about how you got into this space and then Ian and I will catch you up on all the things that we've talked about today, and then you're going to fix the future. It's going to be great. Uh, sure. And thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Ian. And thank you for the invitation. I'm very excited today to speak with everyone about something that's quite near and dear to my heart, which is the, the, the disease of obesity and to discuss um, uh, whatever we can about, I think that concept is about the future of obesity and what we can anticipate and look for. So that'll be fun. Uh, my background, uh, I came from a uh, psychology and neuroscience background in undergrad at university before medical school and uh, entered into medical school. And then I was in my residency uh, in primary care and the, the group asked me, you know, hey, uh, what do you want to look for in primary care? And we can start kind of working on this area. What do you want to kind of focus on? And I advised them that I wanted to start working on um, what are the behavioral change models that we apply in primary care to people who are, say, smoking or drinking too much or uh, struggling with weight? Um, and all of the all of the doctors in the room, I remember, they all looked at me and scratched their head, and they they were kind of like, "What do you mean?" I'm like, "Well, the behavior change. I'm, these are the leading preventable causes of death and disability in your clinical practice." And so, what do we how do we how do we approach these? And they said, well, if someone's drinking too much, we send them to Alcoholics Anonymous. If someone's struggling with weight, we send them to Weight Watchers. If someone's smoking, we give them this book by Alan Carr. And it became immediately apparent to me 25 years ago that the medical system was not set up to manage behavior change or to address, again, the leading preventable causes of death and disability in our in our country and so that you know it's a it's a personality trait of mine that when i notice that something's wrong i kind of can't forget about it and realize i have to do something about it and and then i ran into um uh, well i i ran into online a summary of what is called the diabetes prevention program uh workbooks that were uh, all online and I printed them and I just started my own obesity clinic in downtown Toronto in 2005, uh, 2004, 2005. And I've been seeing 16 to 20 patients every day, five days a week since then. That's fantastic. And how is your brain being broken open in the last 10 years <laughs> with all of the changes that we've seen come through in the science and the evidence that we're, we're starting to see? Would you say that you feel like you feel like we've seen a pretty seismic shift or is this something that's been a slow burn for you and you're just excited that we're all catching up? 
well, I've I've certainly had the kind of um, honor to be in a position where I could see kind of what has been coming down the pipe all along as far as effective treatments. Certainly, um, but there's been a, a problem still. There's actually a, it, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of, let's bring up, let's talk about kind of what might still be the difficulties in, in obesity medicine. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've committed my career to physician education. And so there is, um, there is still this kind of vacuous space between um, ethical, evidence-based, um, effective obesity treatment, which exists, and physicians' education and capacities and willingness and motivation um, to, to practice such said treatment, which leaves people living with obesity, with this real medical disease, um, without access to treatment. That's my focus. I, I, I was listening to you guys and Shai. Shai's awesome. It's so always great to listen to her. And I heard about kind of access to treatments outside of the medical community. But the really interesting part for me is like any other condition, you know, when will we see the transition amongst the medical community where someone living with obesity will walk in and uh, be invited if they wish to discuss obesity and their weight and find a, a caring and ethical and uh, well-trained and uh, effective treatment model. Um, and it, 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 that's kind of the most exciting part for me because when we're there, that'll mean, well, one, I can retire. And two, that people living with obesity will have access right to, right to the appropriate medical model of treatment of the disease. So it's kind of like, there's lots of interesting subjects to, to jump into. Um, I heard you guys talking earlier about communicate. You guys both said that, oh, once I understood the science, it really helped me communicate uh, at a dinner party or amongst colleagues or amongst friends or family. It really helped me communicate what obesity was. And I'm actually going to kind of challenge you guys on that because I actually think the real basis of communicating obesity as a real disease has a lot of room to move still, even amongst us experts. It's a real disease. It's genetics, right? It's a progressive disease. That to me is an insufficient description to really kind of turn the minds of people. And one of the skills that I'm hoping kind of from today is maybe we can even further the skills of self-advocacy by furthering and simplifying our understanding of the science of obesity and how to communicate obesity. So for example, why do some people gain weight and some people don't? The, the prevailing understanding of obesity that it's a collision between an ancient appetite system, this is a brain-centered condition, an ancient appetite system that was built for a time when calories were scarce and work was required. We needed to be motivated all the time to be thinking about and finding food. And that ancient appetite system has collided with our modern food environment where food is ultra processed and ultra available and ultra portioned and we can order it to our door. But why doesn't, because of that collision, everyone struggle with weight? Am I supposed we're to all an individualized mix of cells and experiences and right. You know, right, so, right. right. So, so the traditional answer will be, well, there's genetic differences, right? I mean, mm -hmm. genetically there, but, but what does that exactly mean? So I'll give you an example. Like this is the cool stuff to bring up at a dinner party. Like one of the cool parts of the, the, the cutting edge science around obesity medicine and kind of the future of obesity medicine. So here's an example. Sadaf Faruqi is this fantastic researcher at Cambridge University in the UK. And right now, what is she working on? She's, so she's working in genetics. She's a geneticist slash physician. What is she working in? What area? <clears throat> she's working on the science of thinness. She is asking, someone who lives with obesity herself, she's asking, 
why isn't everyone overweight? <clears throat> Here's this modern food environment. Why? why is there some type of, of a protection that some people have where they're not going to be influenced by this? So she's studying the science of thinness. So this is kind of the, the science of obesity medicine right now. The most exciting stuff is around genetics, I think. <clears throat> Especially when it comes to the future and treatment and effective treatment and finding those who are vulnerable. And so what's Sada Faruqi doing? She she, there's one receptor in the brain called the MC4R, which is kind of the main highway system of appetite and, um, and a conveyor of fullness and loss of interest in food. In fact, many of our anti-obesity medications kind of uh, affect this receptor. And so if you activate this receptor, you're full. You're not interested. You're just like, I'm good. It, like food is not on your mind. Okay, it's called the MC4 receptor. So there's this um, something called the UK Biobank, 500,000 people who have had their entire genome studied from top to bottom. So she takes this group, has access to the UK Biobank data, and she says, let's look for any very, how many variants are there? How many different MC4R receptors are there in these 500,000 people? And, and, and then what are the differences in these variations in genetics? So I, I know we're like digging down into the brain now, but the concept, what she came up with, it, it just blows your mind. She found 60 different variants in this receptor, but most importantly, six of the variants were what are, what are called gain of favor. In other words, they promote fullness and a loss of interest in food. So she found these variants in the main highway of fullness that individuals have and found that if you have these variants from birth, you are protected and defended from ever developing obesity and you are protected forever from ever developing diabetes, according to all of her data. So these, so now we can finally call people who never struggle with their weight mutants, right? So they're mutants, they've got mutations. Right, that's what we can say. Because you always wonder, it's like, um, aren't you finishing your dinner? Well, no, I loved it. But uh, and, uh, you're looking at a half empty plate, right? And, the, and, the, and they're like, well, no, I loved it. I'm just, I'm full. And that person is thin and their parents are thin and their siblings are thin and they're right and their children are thin. And you're like, what the heck is going on here? So now we can call, first of all, we can call them mutants. So that's good, that helps. It, feel, it makes you feel a little better, right? That's one. And then two, we start to understand the science of thinness. And the science of thinness is genetic mutations that write. And so why this work is great, one, it helps us kind of say, oh, so that person that, so someone living with obesity would look at someone who's not struggling with weight and say, oh my God, that person so got it together. They're, wow, they're just so strong and so motivated. And, and you know what? And they would probably promote that story, the thin person. They'll say, oh, no, when I gain five or six pounds, like I just get to the gym and I crack down on my eating. And you're like, well, no, you're just jumping up. So, so that's one, right? One, we've got these individuals who have mutations in the main highway of fullness that makes it that they cannot gain weight for the life of them. Then there's another, like, have you guys heard of the upper intervention point theory of John Speakman? So John Speakman, not. greatest researcher in kind of metabolism and, um, and genetics and energetics in obesity. John Speakman, right, uh, just one of the greats. And he describes really well this concept of an upper intervention point. So already we're like, hey, do you know that people who are thin have genetic mutations? So, right, you're starting, this is dinner table conversations like and what i'm not saying when i say that people who don't struggle with weight have genetic mutations or may have genetic mutations that promote fullness it actually means the receptor never goes away it just sits there so they're full all the time even if they eat a little bit of food i'm not saying when i describe that that obesity is a real disease what we've learned in motivational interviewing in behavioral therapy is we never tell someone what they should think we invite them to consider now that sounds subtle, but what I'm doing is, doesn't that sound like a real medical condition? 
I'm not telling them it's a real disease. You got to be respectful of these people that are struggling with weight. And if you're not, you're biased and you're discriminating against people. No, no, that's not how we change minds. It's not how we change patient mm -hmm. minds. It's not how we change government payors, insurance, clinicians. We invite them. It's kind of like you scratch your head and you're like, hmm, wow, that's interesting. Doesn't it sound like a real disease? So here's another thing. What John Speakman describes is the upper intervention point. So he describes that there is a, a weight that someone will reach, actually a, a percentage of adiposity, right, which is our fancy name for fat. There is a, a, a percentage, and it's a, genetic, a genetically variable trait. There is a certain weight that every human will reach where they reach that weight and they can't go higher. It's called their upper intervention point. It's the point in which their brain intervenes and says no. And what would they feel clinically? They'd be like, oh, I just feel full. I'm not interested in food. They'll bounce against like a glass ceiling. Now, but here's the interesting point is some people's upper intervention point where their brain just shuts them down and they can't gain anymore is still within, let's call it the healthy range of weight for, you know, I, I don't really talk much about BMI, but let's say it's within a healthy range and they actually hit against the glass ceiling and they can't gain anymore. If they do, they're just full, they lose interest in food and everyone has an upper intervention point. It's just where it is is different. So the guy who's six foot two he's always kind of bounced up to 250, 260 pounds. He loses weight, but then he kind of goes back up there. His upper intervention point is at 250, 260, where he can't go up from there. He's still hitting an upper intervention point. It's just higher than the other person. Doesn't that sound like a real medical condition? Isn't that kind of interesting? I mean, remember, we're always inviting, we're not telling. It's like, I don't know, that, that's, I mean, doesn't that sound unfair? Like you're saying, so there's 9,000 different genes. That's what they were thinking now. Maybe nine different, 9,000 different alleles, variants of genes that are contributing to obesity. And, uh, and do you know why, why an upper, okay, this is, I don't know if this is interesting stuff to anyone. It might be a little geeky, but this is the dinner table stuff that you want to give it. Got people thinking, oh my God, I didn't know this about obesity. Like, so here's another. So why is there, how did the upper, Two million years ago, there was, everyone's upper intervention point was low. Two million years ago, according to Speakman, everyone's upper, no one could gain weight for the life of them. Two million years ago, before even Homo sapiens. And it was because we were still uh, uh, species that had predators. So no one could gain weight because if you gained weight by the age of 15 or 16, before you passed on your genes and you were big, lions and tigers and bears would kill you and you wouldn't pass on your genes. And so there was no further, people would not gain weight 2 million years ago. Oh yeah, 2 million years ago, everyone was really thin, totally thin and mobile. Then 2 million years ago, this is Speakman, this is not me. Then we developed arrows and I don't know, like daggers and spears and stuff. And we became the alpha predator on the planet. And then all of a sudden there was no restriction on weight gain and so the rest of the two million years were just random variations in the 9,000 genes that regulate our brain's weight weight regulation system and all those random variations have made different people's different inter upper intervention points and if everyone's listening thinks about it yeah there is a weight that I hit up against that I kind of don't go any further that's the thinking that that's your upper intervention point. And, uh, and again, so if everyone's is different, damn, that's not fair. Doesn't that sound like a real condition? So I guess my point, right, what I'm sharing today is that the, the community, I think we can get better at communication, uh, communicating obesity as a real disease. One, by not telling people it's a real disease, but telling them why we think it might be. And doesn't that mm -hmm. sound like it? What would you, would you, wouldn't you consider that kind of disease-like sounding? right? Um, there's programming that takes place at the brain level that's called neurological sensitization, which is really interesting, and it gets stronger and stronger as time goes by. So let's go backwards for a sec. Well, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to st stop there for a sec to give you the idea that, you know, what if we spent a little bit more time in anecdote 
and, um, and in really primarily genetics and brain and the progressiveness of the disease in really getting even better at communicating these kind of points to people where people are like, oh, damn, I didn't know that. I didn't realize that sounds unfair. Uh, also, that's why that person's struggling with weight. Huh. And again, not telling them it's a real disease, just telling them all these things. Doesn't that sound, doesn't that, that kind of sounds like a real, like a real, um, yeah, like a real disease. So anyway, I, I wanted to, because I knew you guys, I heard you guys in the last segment saying, when I heard about the biology, that really clicked. So that got me thinking, can't we be even better at describing the biology so that we can get more clicks out there and mm -hmm. then people can bring their clicks to the dinner table with their family or with their colleagues or when people are bugging them? It's like, for example, here's another one. Sorry, I'm just talking. But if I, Keep so, going. This is fantastic. All right, all right, all right. So here's another I'm, one. So this I'm, is Arya Just before you go, just before yeah. you go, I'm going to say there's several comments in the chat saying, keep geeking out, Dr. Macklin. This is amazing. So, <laughs> Okay, cool. So Arya Sharma, mentor of all of ours, um, founder of uh, the Canadian Obesity Network. Network. Which, right, which preceded Obesity Canada. We just switched the name to Obesity Canada. Do you know why you had the word network in there? Do you know why you had the word network in there? Because, because it was really multidisciplinary? And that was really about networking and getting people together. Arya Sharma's strengths amongst all his strengths was to be able to put people together. And it was really like Arya would always be like, Macklin, where are you? He'd be texting me at a conference and I'm like, I'm listening to this amazing lecture about the brains, you know, and he's like, get out here. This is about networking. You got to come meet people who are in this, like they're recording the lecture. You can watch it when you get home. You got to meet people, right? Which is kind of what we're doing now. So it's kind of when we're sitting here talking, we're trying to create networks amongst people. So, so, but are you, so what if, what if someone says, oh yeah, I'm taking Ozempic and they're at a dinner table and someone says, well, what does the medication do? What does that do? Let's say they're actually just interested. They're not overtly biased in stigmatizing the individual at the outset of the conversation by, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. You should just be eating less and moving more. But what if they're like, oh, cool. what, is the, what does Ozempic do? Have we armed people well enough who are on anti obesity mm. medications to actually in a simple way communicate that? So this is Arya Sharma. What Arya says is there's only one, there's a singular reason anti-obesity medications exist on this planet and the singular reason is because the brain and this if this doesn't sound unfair i don't know what does the brain is expert maybe the main maybe the main function of the human brain arguably is to recognize fat loss and to fight against it with increased appetite also decreased metabolic rate, but that's a smaller player. The main function of the human brain is to recognize lost adiposity. Again, that's our fancy name for fat. And it recognizes this because fat cells make a hormone called leptin. So leptin levels, when they drop, our brain is extremely sensitive to dropping leptin levels. And so, and that's the only reason anti-obesity medications exist on this planet is because what anti-obesity medications do is they simply defend you against that. That's it. <laughs> If the brain did not defend against fat loss with increased appetite, there'd be absolutely no Ozempic or Manjaro or Contrave or Saxenda. There wouldn't be any of those medications. They wouldn't be needed. The only reason they exist is because, so all of a sudden the person's communicating and saying, what I learned from my physician is that every time I've lost weight, I felt it was a failure I would regain or I'd lose and it would stop and I wouldn't be able to lose anymore. But my doctor explained to me that, no, that's natural. The brain defends against fat loss with increased appetite. So the further you go from your heaviest, the stronger it pushes you back up. So it's very natural that you would struggle and be at risk of weight regain, right? And, and my doctor taught me that your brain defend, maybe the main role of the human brain is to fight against, and then they could lean in with the, doesn't that sound like a real disease? Kind of sounds like a real disease. That sounds, un, that's not fair. That's right. So whatever weight we've gotten to, our brain will bookmark it. And as we start to go down from it, it'll push back with more appetite. Damn. Oh, and that's what the medication does. It just defends you against that. Oh, oh, that kind of makes sense. I never really thought of it that way. Right. So, so 
you know, what we're, what we're looking for is better, better kind of advocacy statements and capacity through story, through anecdote, through the science is really complex, but the concepts aren't complex. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we can kind of, we can, we can explain it. And these are all well validated models, right? This is all, but again, it's in a neurology journal somewhere on the internet. So we have to knowledge translate this to advocate yeah. for ourselves. If we're standing in front of, if we're in front of the parliament, if we're in front of payers, if we're in front of the freaking prime minister, right? We still have to invite them to consider, doesn't this sound like, and so explaining these things. So that's motivational interviewing, right? That's straight from Michael Vallis. Michael Vallis, right? The great psychologist of, right? Obesity medicine psychologist of Canada who co-authored the behavioral chapter of the Canadian. Hey, are, have you guys shouted out yet the how Canada leads the world in obesity recognition and treatment and everywhere we go as Canadians, Canada's recognized as the world leader in obesity medicine. Have you guys shouted that out yet? today we've alluded to it but i don't think we've said it directly <laughs> i don't know if people know that do the do people we're know we're canadian we're shy them? yeah we're shy we're like oh, i don't mean to you know speak too well of ourselves but 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 um the canadian clinical practice guidelines that were written in 2020 uh published in the canadian medical association journal every country writes guidelines for every medical disease there are in Scotland, there is a heart disease treatment clinical practice guidelines that all the Scottish cardiologists wrote about how do we how are we going to treat heart disease in Scotland, right? They get together for three years, they write these guidelines. Something unprecedented has happened. I've never seen this. I think this is unprecedented. The Canadian clinical practice guidelines were so well thought out and written and so advanced and expert that all of a sudden countries are lining up to say, you know what, let's not write our own guidelines for obesity. Let's just adopt the Canadian guidelines. We'll adapt them to some degree. And so Ireland and Chile and Netherlands, and then the United States, the two leading obesity societies in the United States say, um, yeah, we're gonna endorse these guidelines as well. So again, a little shout out to kind of Obesity Canada and to kind of the Canadians. Now, are we advanced in, in in obesity management and treatment? No, but we're just, we're ahead of everyone else. I know that's, like, okay, great. So we're ahead of everyone else. Like, are we very advanced? No, we're still in the kind of early stages of, does our government believe obesity is a real disease? Has the Canadian government said, we believe obesity is a real disease? No. Has the province of Ontario said that? No. I'm in Ontario. No. So, I mean, that gives you a sense as to how far we are, but we're further than others. <laughs> Absolutely. We are. As you're, as you were geeking out there and you're going through all that stuff, there was a couple things that jumped out to me. And one of them was actually a conversation I had with you. And it was when I was talking about, I had first started taking medication uh, after my regain post-surgery. And we were at a conference one time and you asked me how it was going or whatever. And I was trying to put into words, I was trying to explain how it was making me feel. And I said, I, I finally feel normal. Like I have control over food and I've never felt that way before. And I was talking about that and you just looked at me and said, of course, and like had a big smile on your face and you're like, of course you do. And then you explained how you just did. And it just, it makes sense. So having a good communicator, someone who can get that message across is super important and i think i put it in the chat for everyone to look at but your video your explainer video the gatekeeper go-getter and sleepy executive is fantastic and i share it with everyone because i think it's just such an excellent way of explaining that science that we have a hard time describing and how it feels and i think it was really really well done uh thank you and that's been uh, my friends sometimes pull me aside and say, Macklin, you're not that bright or attractive in any way, but you are good at breaking down complex concepts into kind of very kind of simple ways of communicating. So that might be my mild, mild superpower, right? And so what I might have leaned in uh, and mentioned to you, or, or this, is, this is, so you want to really mess up a group of doctors, 
this is how you can mess up a whole room of doctors who doctors have ego and they feel very, you know, you know, they, they feel like they've spent a lot of time in school and they know a lot of stuff. Right. And they do. So I'll, I'll, I'll be in front of a large group of physicians in whatever country and I'll say, okay, kind of speaking to your point just now, Ian, I'll say, okay, if you're treating asthma with medication, you're treating the symptoms of wheezing and coughing and shortness of breath. Yeah. If you're treating osteoarthritis with medication, you're treating joint swelling and disability and pain. Yeah. If you're treating obesity with medication, what symptom are you treating? Uh, oh, um, um, you see thumbs turning and right though i think i think the messaging is getting out slowly but the concept is kind of speaking to what you mentioned ian is we're treating the main symptom of obesity which is uh, an appetite motivation a drive to calorie acquisition that we call wanting for lack of a better word here's the difficulty that you and i have in communicating obesity here's one of the key challenges that we have the main symptom of the disease lives, takes place in the subconscious recesses of our brain where none of us have access to it. So we can't even, only through hinting and through shadows can we actually get a sense of what is the main symptom of obesity. So like, I'd love to be a respirologist. I'd treat a, someone with asthma and they'd come back. I'm like, how's your coughing? How's your wheezing? And they'd be like, oh, well, my wheezing and my coughing is better. Like I cough 10 times instead of 20 because they know what a cough is and they know what a wheeze is. But if, I, if, if a patient comes back, I'm like, how is the reflexive neurological event that gets generated based on external cues through dopamine surges in your midbrain through a Pavlovian learning that's taken place over the last 20 or 30 years, do you find it's dampened? Do you find it's a less of a reflexive drive and motivation to calories in the moments of high risk? It's like, huh? What? What are you talking about, Dr. Macklin? But I can tell you, if someone comes, if someone starts a medication and, and I'm seeing them in two weeks or in four weeks, the last thing I'm going to ask is, have you lost weight? I'm not going to ask them or, you know, what's your weight? Or, right, because that would suggest that the medication is a weight loss medication, and it isn't, right? I'm not treating their weight. It's an outcome of what I'm treating, right? I would ask them, uh, well, what would I ask them? Let's do an exercise for everyone. You've got a chat going back there. Uh, let's do a quick survey for everyone, okay? That will help everyone understand the main symptom of obesity. May as well know the main symptom of obesity. So the question I would have for everyone, and maybe they can fill it into the chat, would be if you look at your day as a timeline from when you wake until you sleep, right? There's the timeline of your day. Do you recognize any times or settings or places or circumstances within the timeline of your day where you would just consider yourself on average to be at higher risk of overeating or less healthy eating or less controlled eating? Are there any times or places or settings? Maybe we could start with one of you guys, but I'd love to hear if anything's coming in on the chat. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on the chat. I think they're just getting it now. There's like a couple second delay here. So we'll see if anyone puts that into the chat. But Lisa, do you have any thoughts there while those are coming in? Yes, afternoon. Go for it. My afternoon lulls are usually like three or four where I know I'm going to be, I've like, my day is steeped enough that if it's a bad day, I'm in a bad day. If I'm in a good day, I'm in a good day. So I'm going to reward myself either which way, or I'm feeling like I just need that extra shot of energy to finish off what's left in front of my day. That's Damn, when I, I would take my notes. Most. I got to take notes. Hold on. This is good stuff. So, yeah. so wait a second. So I heard you describe that there you'll be in the afternoon. Correct me mm -hmm. if I'm wrong. Right. And you will find yourself. Um, yeah, you'll find yourself um, either needing a, a kind of a boost in energy, I think I heard you say. Correct. Um, or also kind of a reward if it's been a bad day yep. or a good day. Or yep, both ways. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
And so, and where, where are you at three to 4 PM? Work, like wrapping up here? work, um, which right now is still in my home. Like a, um, so my, my whole are you okay life. Sharing? Are you okay sharing? You're okay sharing this stuff? Yeah. Have you met me? Yes, of course. Okay, good. Okay. So three, 4 PM at work, kind of still maybe a little bit uh, working rather at home, maybe still a little bit more to do, not quite dinner time, not quite end of day, turn your computer off time, right? Not yet that. Yeah right? Mm -hmm. And you might find yourself having your attention turn into, hmm, like, and you might find yourself, I think you were saying, yeah, even movie, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let me go see, let me go, right, let me go. So here's the key question for everyone. The key question is, what we'll start to describe is that the human appetite system works on a very straightforward Pavlovian or associative learning system. Um, Right, Pavlov taught dogs to salivate to the sound of a bell by pairing a bell with food over and over and over and over again until eventually the bell just triggered salivation because to them the bell meant food. And I know we like to think of ourselves as pretty sophisticated. Us, you know, we get dressed up and we go do webinars, etc. But our appetite system, we share most of our appetite system with mice. So let's not get, you know, too... Too fancy. Yeah, too fancy here. So the question I would have for Lisa, for you, Lisa, is... How many times in your life do you think has that actually happened where the afternoon has been paired with uh, some tasty, what we call reward value food, a food that your brain kind of appreciates as a survival kind of uh, helping food, you know, sugar, fat, salt, like how many times in your life do you think that's actually happened? A majority of the time. And now that you're framing it that way as well, I'm also thinking about that, like, home from school i have walked through the door alone, alone with the bu alone with the bugles <laughs> alone with the bugles. Really isn't, that, isn't that the third chapter of your book it wasn't that the title yes, of the third chapter the in your book alone yeah. with the bugles yeah that was that's right <laughs> it's true though but it's true but like honestly now that you're framing it that way like that started in childhood and i can see how it's like that time but yeah Right, so thousands and thousands and thousands of times, that set of cues has been paired with what are called reward value foods, right? When we talk mm -hmm. about the, 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 the food environment, it's foods that hit all the right receptors from our tongue to our esophagus to our stomach. And we have great data on how they go straight to the parts of the brain where the programming takes place, such that your brain learns that this setting equals food. So what's interesting is there's a disparity between your interpretation or story, bear with me, I wanna say it nicely, and the actual underlying neurological event, right? Because consciously, this is what I said, the symptom is in our subconscious, you won't know it's there, you won't know it's happening. So you're kind of reaching for, I don't know if I just need a boost of energy or I'm like looking for a reward or I'm kind of thinking I need something. But, but Macklin, geeky Macklin is sitting here and inviting you to consider that you're experiencing a surge of dopamine in your reward motivation hedonic system that's triggered based on external cues that is the prime central motivation to food. Other names for wanting, craving, desire. One of my favorite words for this main symptom of obesity is attention bias. It means you could be here, but you're, you're there. You're, hmm. I want, let, let me see, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna mm -hmm. go. That's why we call it the go-getter in the video, right? Because the go-getter gets activated, and it's time to go and get, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're not here anymore. It's time to go and I gotta go and get. Triggered by, so yes, the homework we would leave with patients early on once we classify their higher risk times is to just study, not necessarily change behavior, but just sit and go, oh my God. Look at your watch, look around you, look at the computer, look at the window, look at the angle of the sun and say, holy smokes, I'm Pavlov's dog. Damn, damn, right? And then they go home and the, so their family's like, how was your visit with Dr. Macklin? He called me a dog. I'm like, oh, is that his thing? Is that part of the tree man? <laughs> right, we so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're not that complex. We're I really, know, I was like, just going to say, we're complicated, simple creatures, aren't we? Yeah, we're pretty yeah. simple. Yeah. And there was 
it essentially broke down into two. It was the people that mentioned the afternoon, like Lisa, and then there's people like me that are more the evening after okay. dinner, sit down at TV and away you go. Snack the Every, award. Everyone, the key question everyone can start to ask themselves is how many times has that happened? How many times has this setting been paired with what are called reward value foods? Um, and if they say 10, then we're down the wrong avenue, right? The mm -hmm. clinical historian has to go back in and say, well, let's let's look elsewhere because we went down a blind alley. But if they say hundreds, thousands, right? We're starting to, so what's important here is the, the science papers call this neurological sensitization, meaning that every association builds wires, wires and wires that go from a, a dirt path to a road, to a highway, to a super highway that is uh, allowing the afternoon to trigger wanting, right? And it's progressive. So it gets stronger and stronger. Doesn't that sound like a real disease? That sounds like a jerk. That sounds like a, <laughs> well, but hold on a second. 20,000 years ago, 80,000 no. years ago, it's exactly what you want. It's True. exactly what you want. If you want to pass on your genes, if you want the species to survive, Right, you got to think about food, and by the way, as you lose weight, it only gets stronger. This thing we just talked about the afternoon, and now we know what anti obesity medications do they just defend you against it getting stronger, right? So, this is all the stuff that we, we have to kind of get better at communicating to, to further your guys' work as well mm -hmm. in advocating amongst payers, amongst government, uh, amongst um corporations to recognize and understand. And again, I haven't called obesity a real disease once today, right? I'm just like, damn, that all sounds like a real disease, right? It's progressive and there's all this genetic vulnerabilities and it's so strongly environmentally influenced and there's a sensitization process where it gets stronger and stronger over time and the brain defends against fat loss with increased appetite, damn. Ooh. Okay, well, sounds like a real disease. I don't know. I mean, what do you would you consider, right? And then that's where we kind of in our in our advocacy work with patients say, and therefore, once all that's in, right? And therefore, would you consider that your struggles are not your fault? Mm. So would you consider that you know this has never been about finding the right diet or working out enough or flaunt character or lack of motivation? You've just been living with the real disease untreated. And the best news, and this is where everyone gets excited, the best news is that we have remarkably effective treatments either available now or soon to be available. Uh, and they might be available but not accessible. So we have to work on the access. But, but not only is it a real condition and not your fault, but treatment exists. We have, and mm -hmm. for everyone who's listening, yes, I am talking about advancements in both surgery, but specifically advancements in, in medication because we have the advent of what are called second generation medications. There's kind of, um, you know, uh, the second generation anti-obesity medications, there's one, soon to be two. And, um, but if you look at the pipeline, there's like, there's like eight or nine or 10 coming. I don't know if anyone kind of, the pipeline is kind of the medication. So it takes a long time to have the FDA say, check, this is an anti-obesity medication and this is safe and effective and you can sell it. There's a lot of work that goes into that, but there's phase one and phase two and phase three of these medications and the development and the, the pipeline right now is, like I used to be at these meetings 10 years ago and, and there was like one, maybe a hint of something coming and it was all just in theory. And so from that perspective, things are, yeah, really changing. And that's the really good news. So. When we say real disease, not your fault, treatment exists, that's the mantra. <clears throat> I think we can work on the real disease stuff more, kind mm -hmm. of uh, get a little better where, and, and not say real disease, but kind of explain why we think it's a real disease and invite others to consider it. I know it sounds subtle to tell someone something. People don't like to be told something. They like to be invited. It's like, you're coming to dinner to my house. No. Hey, would you like to come over for dinner? Is that something you would consider doing? Do you want? Is that something you would? Would you come up? Right? It's just different. You don't tell people stuff. 
we invite them to consider. That's motivational interviewing 101. I love that. And that also creates that space for a person to move into new ways of thinking and new ways of delivering care in a way that is really genuine and authentic to their their own experience along the way as well. Right. So if they do it, they do it based on their own uh, Mm -hmm. motivation. They've been invited. Mm -hmm. We just opened up the space and they can come or not. You you can Mm -hmm. come over for dinner or not. That's up to you. And I don't disagree. I think there is something in there for us to take away and think about how we can make, I mean, Professionally, I'm a marketer, so I use the language of of sticky messaging. Um, So to me, yes, I think you're right. I think there are ways that we can make the messaging around obesity specifically stickier without needing to shy away from. Also, I know for me, I often default to it's like or it's comparable to think about it along the lines of diabetes, those kinds of moments. But am I doing that to justify it? Probably a little bit. And your approach really does surface genuinely those facts that are indisputable and just invites people to go, hmm. what's your Scratch process? their head. Your... Kind of like, hmm. Wow. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Damn. That does sound unfair. Right? That's kind of where it lands, right? It's like, oh, that doesn't sound fair. Yeah. Right? And then all of a sudden there's a, the development of potential sympathy with people who are struggling with weight, which is kind of the door opener, right? It's like, oh, kind of look at someone who's struggling with weight differently. So I'm working on that with obviously the patients that I see, but also clinicians, right? My hope is that they look at their patients differently. I, I'm at a doing a master class or part of a conference, and then they show up on Monday and they're 930 patients living with obesity. My hope is that they sit there and go, oh, hmm, you know what, this person's has what I'm starting to see is some significant authentic challenges that have been conferred to them genetically and and environmentally. And uh, let me even just maybe communicate to them that I'm starting to think differently about this. Yes. Right? Just uh, yeah. by the way, I'm not any kind of an expert, but the sciences, I, I kind of, I'm hearing the science is changing. Stay tuned, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and if you ever want to discuss this, maybe we can work through it together. But I'm starting to think differently about weight. Yeah, like I used to 18 years ago, literally, you know, all weight loss has this shape, right? People will lose and then it'll slow and slow and slow and slow and then pull in somewhere. All weight loss looks like that because, again, we already talked today about why that happens because the brain Mm -hmm. defends against fat loss with increased appetite and decreased metabolic rate, but less the decreased metabolic rate. It's way overdone, the decreased metabolic rate. My metabolism has crashed. Nope. Calorie intakes come up. That's what creates generally the slowing and slowing and pulling in somewhere until you're eating the same that you're burning and it's a match and that's kind of this plateau. And so um, being able to communicate that principle as well is, is really, really important. So what did I do 18 years ago? We're sharing our ghosts right now, right? We're sharing our ghosts from the closet. I'd be like, you know what? Because they'd be at this where they're not losing anymore. I'd be like, maybe you have near goal syndrome. I made it up. Maybe you have near goal syndrome where you're feeling so much better that it's actually the motivation is becoming a little bit less. I was saying you're losing your motivation. It's horrific when I think about what I was saying, right? And I wasn't saying, of course, it's slowing down because you're subject to your brain's natural appetite response and slowly insidiously under the radar and in a stuff like way your calorie intake is coming up, but that's how the system's built. And it's not your fault. It's just how it happens. And would you consider just finding most modest lifestyle that's sustainable, livable, and enjoyable and stand back and let your brain and body tell you where that lands, right? That's Canada. We call it your best weight. We're so kind in Canada. It's your best weight, not target goal, not goal weight, not ideal weight. These are all Canadian iterations. They're now globally, globally, um, um, you know, uh, adopted. But um, yeah, we invite people to find their best weight. But I would say, oh, maybe you're just not as motivated. Could you imagine leaning into someone who's working super hard, trying to, and they're they're finding they can't get, uh, you know, and their doctor's leaning in and said, oh, maybe you just have to try deeper. harder. Ah, hey, I'm I'm putting my hand up. I said it. It's 18 years ago, mind you, and of okay. course, it still happens in a lot of doctors' offices today, but not I, mine. I would just- I would just like to pause for a second there and highlight that point. You just admitted to, you know, doing what we are 
you know, we talk about with our community right now saying like it was done wrong and, and you're admitting it and you've done better. So I think this is one of those things where it's like, there's hope where we can change the minds and hearts and, and practice of all these other health professionals out there. I think, you know, it's, it's you're a shining example that I think we should all be pointing to. First time I met Arya Sharma, I had started my obesity clinic 20 years ago. I had a pamphlet. It said weight care, and then it said permanent weight loss. So I went to a lecture in Hamilton, Arya was speaking, and then I caught him as he was walking out. Hey, Dr. Sharma, I'm David Macklin. I'm you know, a family doc. I'm in Toronto. I opened up this clinic. This is my brochure. And he's like, um, okay, David, but uh, permanent. You can't say, um, it's not gonna be, per you gotta cross that out first of all. Um, so, but uh, okay, yeah, it's, uh, otherwise it looks good, but no, you can't say permanent. So you're not gonna, uh, that's my best aria by that's all I've got. Yeah. So they, you know, so that's, that's I love it. There's a lot of us that have that aria story. Yeah, 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 right. And so he's like, okay, cross out, <laughs> cross out permanent because this is a chronic condition right? We all have to learn. We all have to learn and everyone can learn going forward as well. Mm, that's such a um, big part of it. When we know better, we do better, right? And that's, that's exactly what you just shared as well. As we get more information, we should reassess our understanding and our points of view. That shouldn't be a bad thing. So, so let's jump forward for a sec. So, cause I know I was tasked with a little bit of kind of what's the future. Imagine a world, if you will, and this is not far off. Um, there's a very uh, important difference between obesity prevention and obesity early identification and treatment. Obesity prevention is like a, I don't know, I, I don't even like to talk about obesity prevention. It's like, okay, let's make school cafeterias more, you know, let's make sure there's salads there and let's add a, an extra class of gym. We're going to be, and this is the government. This is their, this is the government. This is governments across the world. Obesity prevention. We're doing it. Doesn't work, by the way. Doesn't change anything, right? We might help people eat healthier, but e eating healthier and being active are not treatments for obesity. We have three pillars to treatment, behavioral, medical, and surgical. Diet and exercise are not treatment for obesity, by the way. People are like, what do you mean? We say, and this was in our behavioral chapter, we say changes in eating and exercise are outcomes of treatment. If behavioral and medical treatment are working, then people can make sustained changes in their eating and their activity levels, right? That's an outcome of treatment. It's not eat less, move more. It's treat someone ethically and expertly and effectively. And then if treatment is effective, they'll be able to make sustained changes in their, in their eating and activity. But so let's look forward. So imagine a day because it's not gonna be about obesity prevention, it's gonna be about early identification and early treatment. That's what's gonna change the curve. So it's different. And so imagine a day where there is something called a genome risk score. There are already for heart disease, uh, where all this genome-wide analysis, GWAS, GWAS, which is the technology where an entire genome is studied, and we're able to associate certain traits with certain genes and start to learn about how a trait can be affected genetically. A trait like BMI, like weight. And let's say five years from now that there is a very good genome-wide association score that anyone who has a family history of uh, obesity is welcome as a child to, when the child is born, to get their score. And we already have really good data out of uh, Harvard and Lee Kaplan doing this work, where we now have a score from zero to 100 for, an, for a very, very young child. And that anyone above a 90, and by the way, what the data is showing us is if someone's between a 90 and 100, they have the very similar risks to struggling with obesity as a single gene. The majority of people who struggle with obesity have what is called a polygenic disease meaning thousands and thousands of different genes all mixing together to create their risk. Monogenic obesity, t very, very rare. You won't run into people. It's very, very rare you'll find someone with mono. It's like a single gene that got mutated and it, it blocked their fullness, basically, and they're just ravenous all the time because of a single gene, quite rare. 
So I'm talking about polygenic obesity, which is everyone you've ever run into who's struggling with weight, basically. And so a family that has the risk of uh, obesity and a child who has a score of between a 90 and 100, which is the equivalent risk of someone with monogenic obesity. So it's a high burden, genetic burden. And then you can watch them and see if they develop a velocity of weight gain through their early years. Say they're 12 and they're 13 and you're starting to see their weight take off. And you know they have a 90 or a 92 or a 94. Then what's gonna happen in the future? Okay, maybe 10 years from now, maybe five, is that the, the pediatrician or the family doctor and the parents and the child will all sit together and say, okay, like very significant. You see, when I was describing obesity as a real disease, if you listen to what I was describing, once you reach the highest weight, your brain will bookmark that weight. All the associations with food create neurological sensitization. You see that this is a progressive disease. So if you catch it early, that's actually the whole story because you duck under all of these changes. And we haven't even talked about the inflammation effects of excess fat, excess adiposity, and what that has on the brain, which is also progressive. So we have the opportunity to duck under all of that and by catching it early, preventing. So I wanted to leave you with this kind of interesting, mm. what's the future going to look like? Early prevention, because if that person gets paired with an extremely effective and safe medication, and there are already second generation anti-obesity medications that are uh, Health Canada approved for children between the ages of 12 and 18. And if you get the right treatment to the right person, that's when we'll first see the bend in the curve. You know, obesity rates are still going up and up. So you'll start to finally like, oh, obesity rates are going down. We're finally on top of this kind of a not prevention, but early identification and treatment. It's probably going to be the picture if I had to give a picture. That's still an exciting picture to, to think about, though, to be able to have those kinds of conversations and have a bit of a plan forward. That's fantastic. It's coming. Mm. I love it. You have broken our brains wide open yet again, sir. Thank you so much for the way that you do all that you do and how you really do translate those complex things into ways that feel understandable and approachable because that really is going to make a big difference for, for very, a lot of us, right, very many of us. Is what yeah. Yeah. But I, and I appreciate you challenging us along the way as well, because that's also what this is going to take. We need to challenge the system and the ways and the tools and all the things that we have. So Thank you so much for being part of our closing session. As always, you are a fantastic human to spend time with, to learn from, and we appreciate everything that you're doing and that you have been doing for over 20 years to help advance the narrative around obesity care. Thank My you pleasure. So and you guys, and thanks goes right back to you. You guys are doing absolute <sighs> crazy, difficult, hard. Like if I feel I'm up against obstacles of people not, like you guys are, hearing a lot of that on the front line so congratulations on your very important and difficult work in communicating uh, obesity and advocacy for the for people living with obesity much appreciated amazing thank you so much all right